And thanks to everybody who's uh, listening in today. You know, we'd love for you to keep the conversation going on, um, you know, across Twitter at hashtag KCRS20. And uh, it's now my pleasure to take us into our official session one. We're going to be led by Dr. Naomi Haas from the University of Pennsylvania, as well as uh, Eric Yonash from uh, MD Anderson. And we're talking about the next frontier, new molecular targets for kidney cancer. So Eric and Naomi, take us into the next frontier. So building on our next, uh, on Bill Kalin's talk, I think our next speakers are exploring other uh, topics, other uh, targets that uh, probably are very relevant to the HIF pathway. Great, thanks Naomi. Yeah, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the next speakers. Uh, really building on the work that, that Dr. Kalin has, uh, has, has launched in, in understanding the biology of renal cell carcinoma. And we have four really cool and, and somewhat interrelated talks um, that we're gonna go over here. And our, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Chen San Chi. He's associate professor at the uh, Center for Genomic and Computational Biology at Duke University. And, uh, his lab uses functional genomic approaches to investigate uh, the nutrient signaling and uh, um, stress adaptations of cancer cells when exposed to various nutrient deprivations and uh, microenvironmental stress conditions. And, and he's recently focusing on, a, on two areas. The first is really elucidating uh, the genetic determinants and the disease relevance of apoptosis, uh, an important uh, process of cell death. Uh, and the second related to this is he's identified the mammalian stringent response pathway, which is uh, highly similar to the bacterial stringent response pathway, uh, which is related to, to phreptosis, as I mentioned, uh, but has some interesting twists and novel mechanisms. And um, the title of his talk is Mammalian Stringent Response Triggered by MESH-1 Inhibition. Today, I'm going to share about our research on mammalian stringent response triggered by MASH-1 inhibition. So the classical and the uh, clear cell renal cell carcinoma characterized by loss of the tumor suppressor gene VHL. There's also VHL leading to a barren hypoxia pathway and that drive a lot of oncogenesis. To identify the nutrient uh, addiction of uh, the VHL loss renal cell carcinoma, we perform a nutrient dropout screen by removing every single amino acid. And as you can see, the removal, the removal of most uh, amino acid leading to prolifer uh, proliferation arrest without uh, causing cell death. Unexpectedly, the removal of cysteine leading to a very, very dramatic cell death. The most importantly, these cell deaths are actually by mitigated when the VHL is introduced this cell. This imply the cysteine addiction is a synthetic lethal property associated with a VHL loss that can be of therapeutic potential. We have verified a cysteine deprived uh, uh, cell death using the crystal violet and the xenograph using cell line xenograph and patient derived xenograph. And we are exploring the therapeutic potential. The cysteine deprivation and erasting cause a form of cell death called phaeotosis. And this is a form of, of a cell death actually triggered by oxidative stress and characterized by lipid peroxidation and iron dependence. To identify the biological process and the genetic determinant of phaeotosis, we perform genome-wide genetic screen and identify 400 essential hit. That's when silencing will actually protect cell from phaeotosis. We have published a few paper on several uh, known uh, protein we have found to be essential for phaeotosis. But today I'm gonna to talk about one protein particularly. This protein is called MASH1. It stands for metazole and spot T1 homolog. It is a human homolog protein for bacteria protein called SPAT-T. As you can see, these are the evolution conservation of the domain structure from SPAT-T or bacteria and plant to, a human, to animal. So SPAT-T involved in bacterial stringent response. This is the main way the bacteria cope with metabolic stress and nutrient deprivation. 
So upon this uh, stress, there was this one metabolite called PPGPP that went up dramatically during the stringent response. And the PPGPP is regulated by two proteins. One protein is SPAR-T that actually degraded PPGPP. Therefore, the SPAR-T inhibition will lead to PPGPP elevation and trigger stringent response. Another protein is called RELA, responsible for synthesis of PPGPP. So MASH-1, importantly, why actually also uh, retain the ability to degrade PPGPP. And when we actually remove the MASH-1, it protects a wide variety of cells from phenotosis up to a week. So this phenotype is similar to SPAR-T inhibition and the reminiscent of a stress survival phenotype of bacterial syringe response. But the most interesting question, what are the most relevant human substrate? So as I mentioned, the MASH-1 preserves the ability to degrade PPGPP, but human cells don't have PPGPP. We also don't have homolog RA that synthesizes uh, the PPGPP. We actually, therefore, the, we, the MASH-1 must mediate the infection from an independent substrate. To identify this uh, substrate, we actually first using the metabolomic approach, try to identify every single metabolite that increase under MASH-1 approval. We tested all these metabolites, but couldn't find change that at the direct substrate. Until we cooperate with the paid out in the Duke Biochemistry Department, we found that MASH-1, the substrate in human is NADPH. This is actually the first NADPH phosphatase identified in human. As you can see, incubate NADPH with MASH-1, leading to converted the to become NADH as verified by mass spec, as well as in organic phosphate as detected by green assay. So, and to further actually consolidate this result, we solved the structure of MASH-1 NADPH complex and define a critical residue, allow us to generate an amended deficient mutant to actually establish the, effect, the relevance of this, uh, enzyme, uh, this enzyme activity. So during phytosis, we found that NADPH dropped significantly. That's actually accumulated uh, associated with MASH-1 induction. When we remove MASH-1, NADPH is sustained at a higher level that allows the cell to actually protect from phytosis. Most relevantly, there's another enzyme called NADK mediated the opposite reaction of NADH. Uh, MASH-1, and uh, when we silence in NADK, both of phytosis protection phenotype and NADPH elevation phenotype upon the MASH-1 silencing get abolished. This established the NADPH phosphatase is responsible for the phytosis phenotype. Unexpectedly, we also found upon the MASH-1 removal, we lead into actually very dramatic proliferation arrest and very other anti-tumor effect, including the cell culture during long-term cell culture, including tumor sphere and body tumor sphere, and a xenograft in a body tumor xenograft. So all these results suggest that the MASH-1 deletion, similar to bacterial SPAR-T inhibition, has a similar phenotype in terms of stress survival and arrest phenotype. Right now, we actually are looking for therapeutic targeting of cystic addiction in renal cell uh, carcinoma and identify biological pathway and relevant substrate of human stringent response, as well as uh, try to therapeutically targeting this uh, human stringent response using chemical and genetic means. And we are very, very grateful for the department uh, funding of DOD, as well as the uh, uh, hard work of uh, people in my lab and cooperator from PayZal. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any question. So that was very nice talk. I have one question uh, and uh, we're also looking to see questions from the audience. So, um, what if you were to uh, combine this pathway with any other pathway for kidney cancer? What would you uh, what what would you start with? Would you start with uh, the VEGF pathway, or would you start with more of a nutrient driven pathway? So I think uh, we actually also have additional data trigger the stringent response, other than have some fe conserved feature of bacterial stringent response. 
also actually can trigger innate immune response. So I think we are exploring the possibility with combined with immunotherapy that basically will have this uh, uh, basic novel feature of this response in human cell. And we are actually trying to understand the mechanism as well as the security potential of this potential combination. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question you for you. Yeah, sure. I have a question for you as well. So, so one of the things that uh, that Dr. Kalin alluded to was sort of the interaction between between genetic defects, and uh, one of the things that is, is ferroptosis is modulated by p53. We know that uh, yes. the presence of p53 seems to decrease it. The absence of it um, will enhance it, and and in, in this situation. Um, What's your sort of what are your thoughts on the, the, the polygenic interactions that we're undoubtedly going to see in renal cell carcinoma and how does that influence your your approach to this? Yeah, I think that that's actually a very, very good point. I think uh, the interaction of P53 is a very, very complex and uh, is a very, very context dependent. I think uh, in this, at least uh, in a renal cell carcinoma, I think the dominant feature is a loss of VHL. And uh, the sensitivity to the ferrotosis of renal cell have been verified by many different labs. And uh, so I think uh, a P53 definitely play a role here, but I think it is the interaction, it's hard to use a P53 in the context here to predict. And because sometimes there are some kind of P53 seem to sensitize, sometimes it seems to resist. Uh, in a renal cell setting, I think uh, the dominant feature is a VHL lost which is, I think is a very consistent feature. And that actually build a possibility of a synthetic lethality relationship based on a nutrient addiction. Thanks. Naomi, do we have any other uh, questions? I don't see any other questions here. Um, just looking to our uh, to Brian or Susan if you spot any other questions as well. I, I don't see any present right now. I think uh, moving on to the next presentation would be appropriate. Yeah, thank you very much. Great, thank, thank you. you. All right. Um, so our second speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Ching Zhang. And he's an associate professor uh, in the Department of Pathology at UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center. Um, he performed his uh, postdoctoral research actually with Dr. Kalin uh, and um, in 2013 established his own lab at uh, the, uh, the UNC Chapel Hill Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center um, and was, uh, was ultimately promoted to associate professor in 2019. And uh, in 2019, he moved his lab to the UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center. Um, his topic uh, is, again, an incredibly interesting and timely topic, which is uh, um, tank binding kinase 1 or TDK1 serves as a novel therapeutic target in kidney cancers uh, with VHL loss. So uh, looking forward to hearing this talk. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to give a talk on DOD sponsor project on TPK1 as a potential therapeutic avenue in kidney cancer with VHL loss. I'll spare some background on VHL and kidney cancer since Dr. Bill Kidding already gave an outstanding talk previously. So, this project is mainly focused on whether TPK1 can serve as a synthetically sanity target with VHL loss. First of all, what is synthetically sanity? Sensitivity Society was reviewed by Bill uh, in 2005 Nature Review Cancer previously, but this is an updated review by uh, Bene, uh, 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 Rene Bernard uh, showing that in normal cells, there's gene named B. Bosawata, while in cancer cells, there's one gene either mutated or overexpressed. In this case, you could think VHR is the most predominant tumor suppressor that is frequently lost in kidney cancer. So we want to find whether the other targets that potentially specific targeting VHL loss tumor cells. So in this study, we found TPK1 is one of the synthetic sided binding uh, partner for VHL loss. TPK1 is originally identified as an important molecule for innate immunity, where DNA, RNA, or LPS will lead to TPK1 activation, which contributing to IF3 phosphorylation 
translocation and turn on the type 1 interferon response. So in terms of the role of typical one in cancer or under studies, so in this case, we want to see whether typical one can uh, specifically be targeting for VHL loss. So to answer this question, we obtain typical one sgRNAs by CRISPR-Cas9 strategy by knocking down typical one with two different sgRNA and taking those UMRC2, which is a VHL now, or those cells restore the VHL. We can see that typical one depletion can specifically kill those tumor cells uh, with VHL loss, but not with VHL water restoration. We also see so similar phenomena with another cell line. So the quick question is that how typical one may be synthetic diesel for VHL loss? So we did extensive amount of mechanistic study. We found that in those tumor cells, loss of VHL, they have high typical one phosphorylation. Upon the VHL restoration, those phosphorylation was decreased. While the total level of typical one was not changed. Also, other family member including IKK epsilon was not changed either. Also, use the VHL water of cells depleted VHL by S CRISPR Cas9. We also see that on the reverse pattern, VHL loss leads to hyperactivation of phosphorylation of TPK1. So in clinic speaking, uh, in patient tissues, when you look at these two patient tissues, and then in tumors, we saw the hyperactivation of TPK1, when in normals, the phosphorylation is low. We also confirmed this phenotype by two different TMAs uh, staining, which is collaboration with Dr. Kangong at Beijing University. In terms of therapeutically, we generate typical CRISPR uh, uh, induced by SHRNA knockdown cells. And then upon tosacycline addition, those SHRNA will take effect in vivo. So we can appreciate that the control cells grow readily while typical one depletion upon tosacycline leads to a slowdown of the tumor growth which is shown in bioluminescent imaging here. We also take those lung tissues uh, ex vivo upon the necropsy. We also see increased uh, uh, bioluminescent intensity in the lung tissues, which represents the spontaneous metastasis, but not typical knockdown cells. Uh, Therapeutic speaking, we also use this typical inhibitor, which you already described by David Barbie in cancer discovery a couple years ago, showing that the UMRC6 cells which is the VHL now, the compound Y is effective. But when we restore the VHL, those cells actually largely intact. So it's showing the 3D soft ACA AC as well. So this inhibitor could be effective. Mechanistically speaking, we show that upon VHL wild type or low marks condition, typical phosphorylation can be decreased by the VHL binding, followed by the PPM1P, which is phosphatase which will lead to typical one dephosphorylation. On the other hand, your VHL is lost or tumor is hypoxic. Due to the VHL loss or due to this inhibition, typical one hydroxylation, the VHL will not bind, which will not introduce the dephosphorylase, phosphatase, PPM1B, and then this PPM1B will lead leads to the dephosphorylation, typical one phosphorylation. Therefore, typical one can maintain hyperactivation contributing to P60 phosphorylation as well as tumor genesis. So in summary, we show that VHL now can, uh, cells are sensitive to TB1 depletion or inhibition. We also show that the VHL loss can lead to hyperactivation in TBK1 in terms of tumor cells or CCRC patients. And then by performing global phosphoproteomics, we show that TBK1 is essential uh, for CCRCC tumor genesis by phosphorylating P62 on this novel phosphorylation site, 7366. Moving forward, we have a few different directions. We want to test TPK1 in you know, osteotopic xenograph, PDX, and mouse models available at UT Southwestern. We're also in the middle of developing the serpent based TPK1 prototypes. In addition, we're very interested to identifying the upstream signaling, which is important for typical phosphorylation in kidney cancer. So with that, I want to thank the people who contributed to this work, especially the first author, Lian Xin, who, who spearheaded this project. I also want to thank all of the collaborators, both at UNC as well as UT Southwestern. I want to especially thank the uh, support from Kidney Cancer Research Program 
led by the Dr. Jim Pergrales at UT Southwestern. And lastly, I want to thank the uh, support from DOD uh, DO Development Award for this project. Thank you for your attention. So I'll start off with, with one question. That was a great talk. Uh, do you have access to any uh, primarily resistant kidney, kidney cancer cell lines? It seems to me 20% of kidney cancer patients don't respond to either uh, VEGF inhibitors or um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, this might be an interesting target to test in that population. Great question, Dr. Haas. Uh, I think that this is a, a very insightful suggestion. We actually use the uh, HIFTR for intrinsic resistance cell line, like Dr. Bill Kading uh, suggested, the UMRC2 in our system. We found that uh, depletion of TPK1 by using sgRNA or inhibitors can uh, kill those tumor cells. So suggesting that this could be affecting those uh, HIFTR resistant uh, tumor cells. Thank you. Uh, I do want to point out, Bill Kidding, uh, Dr. Bill Kidding actually is very sharp eyes. We have one uh, slide with mislabeling, uh, reverse heat from alpha VHL, but that was correct in the original publication. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Just want to point that out. I have a question for you. Um, so, you know, TBK1 is part of the sting pathway and the innate immune the cell, the tumor cell autonomous innate immune response. Um, it's also important for uh, other immune cells. So although this may actually achieve some degree of synthetic lethality for VHL null cells, you may actually be knocking out one of the key drivers of immunogenicity. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? And what are your strategies to perhaps refine your approach? Another great question, Eric. Uh, we actually look at TPK1 downstream signaling in uh, tumor cells. Uh, in this case, we don't see type 1 interferon response, such as phospho F3 being uh, either downregulated upon TP1 depletion or upregulated upon TP1 overexpression, suggesting that the effect of TP1 in this case is cell autonomous. We also performed RNA-seq data after we pu publish, uh, published this paper in cancer discovery. We also did not see type 1 interferon response being uh, affected in this uh, TPK1 depleted cells, suggesting that in this case, somehow the kidney cancer cells has uh, uh, sort of relatively low endogenous uh, type 1 interferon response or F3 signaling. So we, we, we assume that this TPK1 targeting in this uh, uh, kidney cancer cell setting may be uh, uh, mostly uh, beneficial. Another perspective I want to point out is that there are multiple uh, publications, either from the unbiased genomic screening, such as uh, published by Nick Hanning uh, three years ago, or David Barbie's group in Cancer Discovery, or recent Nature Cell Biology by Shao Song Sun's group, combining TPK1 inhibitor with uh, immunotherapy uh, can actually enhance the immunotherapy efficacy rather than. Uh, uh, decrease immunotherapy efficacy. There are a lot of things to be learned from this perspective. But well, that's a great question. Thanks. There was one other question, which was just, could you elaborate a little bit more about uh, what uh, which TBK1 inhibitors uh, are currently available, uh, at least in the lab? OK, uh, there are a few TBK1 inhibitors. Uh, in the laboratory setting. So the one we use is called Compound 1, developed by Gilead originally, characterized by David Barber's group a few years ago. So there are also another TPK1 inhibitors called Ameli z -Lox, but those are actually not uh, specific TPK1 inhibitors because they also affect uh, IKK epsilon. Uh, so uh, the potential caveat with those inhibitors are not necessarily very specific. So right now we're developing the serum-based TPK1 protac. So we have some data showing that this protac can specifically deplete TPK1 expression, but not affecting IKK epsilon. So we also saw very strong phenotype in terms of killing those VHL null cells. 
so at this time, we're trying with some animal experiment with those uh, prototype. We'll see how that works. There's also one more uh, question. It looks like from uh, Bill Kalin it says TBK1 does not look like a cancer dependency in DEPMAT. Any explanation? Very good question. Uh, uh, in terms of the cancer depth uh, map, uh, I think that uh, is uh, sgRNA or sRNA screening. Uh, in this case, uh, they are dealing with the either show sort of uh, beginning as ends those genomic sequencing. In our case, uh, we developed this TPK1 based on a little bit longer term user with the uh, colony formation assay or 3D soft target assay. Uh, our assay is not necessarily based on the uh, cell proliferation over time, but rather than colony formation is on 2D or 3D. That being said, uh, uh, we acknowledge that uh, TPK1 was not scored in the uh, dependency map. That's something we should also look into more closely uh, in a genome wide scale. So we actually uh, uh, still actively work on that in terms of how to explain the differences in terms of genome wide screening versus a little more focused uh, 2D or 3D colony formation uh, uh, in terms of phenotype uh, uh, observation. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in the interests of time, we should move on. Uh, there are a few more questions that are coming up and, and maybe what we can do is at the end, we can um, elaborate a little bit more. I, I think there was interest in how it was uh, identified, what, what screening uh, you used. Yeah, we can, we can talk about that. We do have a discussion period where everybody can talk together and we'll, we'll, we'll address those then. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so our third speaker today is uh, going to be um, Dr. Uh, Ching Chen Chen, and uh, she's also an associate professor with tenure in the Department of Internal Medicine at, uh, at UC Davis, uh, where she's a principal investigator in a number of uh, grants, uh, national and state funded. And, and her research interest lies in a mechanism based target identification and, and drug discovery in cancer. And her labs actively engaged in the discovery of novel therapeutics and improved uh, or combinatorial efficacy by targeting aberrant cell signaling and metabolic reprogramming. Um, she's actually going to be talking about a very interesting topic, which is um, targeting IGF1R signaling in MTAP deficient kidney cancer. So uh, let's have that talk. Thank you for having me at this conference. Today, I would like to introduce a novel mechanism of how aggressive kidney cancer cells can shift from using metabolic pathway to signal transduction, thereby providing a progression advantage to tumor cells. In recent years, kidney cancer, as known as RCC, has been considered a metabolic species. Therefore, we compare metabolite profiling between adjacent normal kidney tissue and RCC specimen in order to identify the potential metabolic pathway associated with RCC progression. In the comparison metabolite between normal and RCC tissue, we found dysregulation of the polyamine pathway in RCC. A lot of polyamine and their end product MTA are significantly upregulated in RCC cells. Here, I would like to introduce MTAP, which is a major enzyme to convert the metabolite MTA into adenine and methionine. Given an increase in MTA level in RCC, we suspect the accumulation of MTA may result from downregulation of MTAP gene. Our previous CGH array data have shown MTAP gene is deleted in up to 50% of RCC by the analysis of 19 kidney cancer cell lines in a screen TCGA data set, the deletion rate of MTA is about 3 to 5%. In this data set, we observe the kidney cancer patient with MTA deletion. Their overall survival is worse than those patients with MTA dispersion. In addition to public data set, our HC standing result have confirmed high expression of MTA protein in normal kidney tissue but MTA protein is decreased in most of kidney cancer specimen. 
by analysis another cohort of patients, we show MTEP is protein expression is higher in low-grade tumors. And there is, there is a great dependent decrease of MTEP expression in RCC. As MTEP is lost in high-grade RCC cells, we use CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out MTEP gene in low-grade RCC cell in order to mimic a high-grade tumor. After MT not all, cell became elongated and spindle-like, which are epithelial mesenchymal transition phenotypes. Through MT not all and overexpression studies, we demonstrate MT expression can control EMT phenotype in cancer. The biofunctional assay have also confirmed both cell invasion and migration activities are increased in response to MT not all. Next. We investigated, investigated more molecular profiling between MT wild type and NAO cells. Through transcriptome analysis of MT media pathway, we noticed MT expression is associated with immune response. In particular, the JNK state pathway, which functions in the regulation of PDL1 expression. The PD1, PDL1 pathway is an active regulator of activated T cell. Once PD1 binds to PDL1, this interaction results in T cell inactivation and apoptosis. In antenna out cells, we observe an increase in PDL1 expression, including surface PDL1. Therefore, we would like to ask if tumor killing activity of T cell is repressed after interacting with antenna out cells. To prove this, we incubate cancer cells with T cell, which, which were isolate from human PBNC after 72 hours co culture Cell viability was still high in antenna out cell as compared to the wild type of cells, such as thin lot. Antenna out cells are resistant to killing by T cells. By using a 3D co culture system, we noticed the T cell population was changed by antenna expression in an activated T cell. Several markers such as CD107, IL2, or interferon gamma are increased, but they are decreased in an exalted T cell. We then analyze these markers. Data from flow cytometry analysis shows CD8 positive T cell activity was inhibited after co culturing with antenna out cells. From this study, we confirmed MTA deficiency occurs in high grade RCC. And this deficiency induces PDL1 expression, leading to tumor progression and immunosuppression. As I mentioned earlier, MTEP loss results in MTA accumulation in RCC, in addition to being a metabolite. MTA is a major inhibitor of PMT5, which means MTA is able to inhibit PMT5 activity and protein methylation. Indeed, our Western broad data demonstrated lower protein methylation in antenna out cells. Given the crosstalk between protein methylation and phosphorylation, we confirm all three types of protein phosphorylation, but only tyrosine phosphorylation was changed and upregulated in antenna out cells. Due to a change in cellular tyrosine phosphorylation level, we performed a phosphorotyrosine kinase array to identify molecular, molecular regulated by MK expression. We found IGF-1R is the top rank receptor tyrosine kinase. The IGF-1R and its signaling pathway play an important role in oncogenic process, such as cell proliferation and EMT. As you can see, antenna out cell displayed activation of IGF-1R and the downstream signaling of IGF-1R such as SAC and STAT3 are also activated in response to antenna R. Therefore, we use IGF 1R inhibitor lincetinib to suppress IGF 1R activity. After lincetinib treatment, both IGF 1R activity and PDL1 expression were repressed, such as IGF 1R activity regulates PDL1 expression. We also noticed at the same dosage, Lincetinib is more effective in antenna out cell as compared to the wild type cells. In summary, we demonstrate that IGF-1R is the major driver pathway in antenna out cells, leading to cancer malignancy 
and immunosuppression. Therefore, targeting IGF-1 signaling may be a therapeutic strategy for the management of MPEG deficient cancer. Thank you very much for your attention. That was a great uh, talk. These are all great talks. I um, wondered uh, if you could elaborate a little bit more on what other uh, IGFR inhibitors are out there. I know they've been tested in uh, some other malignancies. I think adrenal cortical carcinoma co comes to mind. Um, can you comment on, uh, on those? Thank you, Dr. Hart, for your question. Uh, actually, uh, the, there are several um, IGF-1 inhibitor undergoing clinical trial, and some of them fail in clinical trial. For the lincetinib, uh, for, for other type of um, IGF-1 inhibitor has been tested but failed in clinical trials, such as in lung cancer. But the, for lincetinib, this one is kind of very potent, and so, in, in, another uh, for uh, compared to other type of inhibitor, this inhibitor is more specific, only targeting IGF-1 R, uh, and IGF-1 partially IGF uh, uh, IGF-1 R and partially IGF-2. But uh, the major uh, uh, inhib inhibition will be IGF-1 R. So this is more the, the effect of this inhibitor. To my best knowledge, this is more uh, sharp instead of broad. So, yeah. There's a question from Dr. Kalin uh, regarding is IGF-R1 being on target? IGF-1, excuse me? IGF-1 has been? IGF-R1 uh, being on target. IGF-R1. For the for the inhibitor, the inhibitor or the inhibitor, to my best knowledge, is just only IGF one R A. But if I'm uh, if I'm wrong because I I didn't uh, check to update if there any. Um, modification or optimized inhibitor for, of this inhibitor. So maybe I'm wrong and please cor correct me. There's one, there's one other question, which is um, uh, MTAP loss is a common feature of many tumor types. Are they all associated with IGFR and PDL1? Uh, if you know, for the PDL1, I hasn't looked at other type of cell because uh, I, I, for for the for the RNA seq data, just only for RCC. So that's the um, immune response is top rank. Um, MTA media pathway. So I have no idea uh, for other type of cancer. But for the, you know, we, we test cancer and in lung cancer. And so for the, um, Lung cancer and kidney cancer, we observe similar phenomena and not other type of cancers. I'm going to jump in here, but I think we're having some internet connectivity issues with Dr. Chen. Maybe we should uh, try to see if we can revisit that one when we get back to the panel discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. All right. Uh, we're going to move on now to our, our last uh, speaker, um, and it gives me uh, pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Boy Gan, who's uh, Associate Professor in the Department of Experimental Radiation Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, he came to MD Anderson after completing a postdoctoral fellowship under Dr. Ron DePino. And uh, currently his lab is mainly studying the mechanisms of ferroptosis and nutrient dependency and its relevance in cancer development and treatment. 
Um, Dr. Gan has served as a PI of multiple grants. He's got R01s published in top journals and, and has done wonderful work. And his uh, title is Studying BAP1 and Regulating Glucose Dependency in Renal Cell Carcinoma Mechanisms and Preclinical Translation. I want to thank the meeting organizer for inviting me uh, to present in this conference. Our project supported by this key therapy grant uh, aims to target BAP1 deficient kidney cancer. So BAP1 is a tumor suppressor that is mutated in up to 15% of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, or the predominant RCC subtype. BAP1 mutant clear cell renal cell carcinoma exhibit poor clinical outcomes with significant shorter survival. However, currently there is no effective therapy for treating this type of cancer. Now, on the molecular level, BAP1 is a nuclear deepigenation enzyme, also called a DAP, that functions to uh, deepigenate histone H2A on chromatin and therefore regulates gene transcription. However, the key downstream targets of BAP1 immediating BAP1's tumor suppression uh, in kidney cancer remains largely unknown. So previous studies from our lab uh, by using an unbiased approach identified uh, amino acid transport called SRC711 as a key downstream target of BAP1 in kidney cancer. So SRC711 functions as a cysteine transporter to import cysteine into the cells. So cysteine will then be utilized as a precursor to generate the glucyon, which is subsequently used by an enzyme called glucyon peroxidase 4 or GPX4 to detoxify lipid hydroperoxides in the cells. Now, when cells accumulate a lipid hydroperoxide to lethal level, uh, that would induce a type of cell death now known as fructosis. Uh, so this type of cell death is different from other cell deaths such as apoptosis, and in recent years has sparked great interest in the scientific community. So we found that the BAP1 normally functions to suppress the expression of SSC711 and therefore inhibit its immediate to the system uptake, and therefore promotes the fructosis. Uh, we propose, uh, we also show evidence that fructosis, uh, similar to apoptosis, is a tumor suppression mechanism. So therefore, in BAP1 mutant tumors or deficient kidney cancers, so when BAP1 is lost, so that leads to a aberrant expression of SSC711 expression and uh, leading to a decreased fructosis and consequently increased kidney cancer development. Now, it turns out that the system, the, the SSC11 uptake system, but system needs to be, once inside the cells, it needs to be uh, further reduced to a related amino acid called cysteine. So as shown here, cysteine basically is the oxidizing dimeric form of two cysteines linked by uh, disulfide bonds. So in our extracellular space, because it has much more oxidizing environment. So cysteine concentration is much higher than cysteine, so therefore cells need to uptake cysteine instead of cysteine into the cells. But then because the cytoplasm has a much reducing environment, so cysteine then will be quickly reduced to cysteine, uh, so through a reduction reaction uh, which consumes in ADPH. So then cysteine will subsequently be used to uh, synthesize glucosine. So it turns out that this reduction reaction has a significant impact on maintaining the redox homostasis in kind of cells with high expression of SSA semi-level. Because it turns out that cysteine is the least soluble amino acid among all common amino acids. So therefore, when cells are taken cysteine into the cells, uh, when the cysteine accumulate to high levels inside the cells, that can cause toxicity issues. So to avoid these issues, the kind of cells are forced to quickly reduce uh, cysteine to cysteine. So however, this reduction, by reducing uh, cysteine to cysteine, uh, that can improve the solubility by more than 1,000 fold. However, because this reduction reaction consumes any pH, which is the reducing power in our cells, so that leading to the cells consume a large number of any pH uh, for maintaining this reduction reaction. And that's, that also leads to glucose dependence because any pH is primarily supported by glucose through the pentose phosphate pathway, or PVP. So when we culture the kind of cells with high expression of SSC711 under the glucose-free medium, so that can cause significant uh, issues in our cells because then 
the system will uh, largely accumulate, as shown here, you see a huge accumulation in the SSN711 high expression kind of cells uh, under the glucose free medium, and they also deplete the NADPH, then the cells quickly die under the glucose uh, free medium. So taking advantage of this metabolic vulnerabilities as shown in the uh, kind of cells with high expression of SSS711, so we propose perhaps we can use uh, gluten inhibitors to target BAPI mutant kind of cells because those cells tend to express high expression of this transporter. So shown here are two different gluten inhibitors. We found that indeed the gluten inhibitor can exhibit more toxicity or cell death inducing effect uh, in the kidney kind of cells with high expression of SSS711 with BAPI mutation, uh, then in the kind of cell with low expression of this transporter with BAPI wild type. And we first validated this in the PDX model by showing that the root inhibitor had, uh, had much more significant impact on suppressing tumor formation in the PDX model with high expression of SSS11 compared with the PDX model with low expression of this transport. So basically, this is the master slide which we propose uh, two strategies to target SRC711 in kind of therapy. So first is to directly inhibit SRC711 mediated system uptake. So currently there are a lot of interest to uh, develop novel inhibitors of this transporter uh, to inhibit, to induce proptosis in kind of therapy, uh, which will not be covered in this talk. The second part, uh, which is covered in this talk, is to target its associated metabolic vulnerability, uh, including the glucose dependence, as I uh, talked in my talk, and also other people show that can also induce uh, glutamine dependency. So with that, I would like to end my talk by thanking my nine members who have been involved in this project, Ilei, Pranovi, and Xiaoguang, uh, our collaborators, and the funding support, uh, particularly the uh, funding support from KCRP. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so do you think that uh, doing uh, some prospective studies uh, looking at uh, patients whose tumors have BAP1 mutations, that, uh, that that would be a good way to start uh, investigating these pathways? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, one way is to use, so we propose basically to use any skin kidney cancer uh, we can use BAP1 mutation as kind of a, a biomarker to select the you know, the, the patients who potentially have high expression of this transporter, and if possible, can, you know, um, potentially can, uh, you know, use, for example, gluten inhibitor to treat those uh, patients. So based on our preclinical study, we, su those, we suggest that BAPA mutant tumors, the, the patients with BAPA mutation uh, could be more susceptible to, uh, to gluten inhibition. Thank you. So I'm curious, uh, Boy, uh, you know, it looks like BAP1 might be regulating uh, some elements of the ferroptosis pathway here. Have you looked at um, CFD2 or PBRM1 mutated tumors to see whether or not this will uh, select for BAP1 mutated tumors or whether those are also vulnerable or, or perhaps resistant to ferroptosis? Right, so, so actually, uh, so we have done this in our previous publications. So basically we have a panel of cell lines correlated with uh, mutations with BAP1 or you know, PBRM1, as they just uh, suggested, uh, CD2. So in general, we see a correlation with BAP1 mutation. So that's about you know, 10 to 15% uh, mutation rate in, in, in clear surveillance cell carcinoma. But we, we don't see, yeah, we don't see a clear uh, correlation with PBRM1, for example. Yeah, obviously all those kind of cell line, uh, kidney cancer cell lines we have tested are uh, virtual now. So they don't really show a correlation with the VHL status. There's a couple of questions from the audience. One of them is uh, high specific uh, uh, is upregulation of uh, SLC7A11 and BAP1 mutant or other SLC proteins also upregulated? Uh, so in our study, we have many folks on, you know, this cystine transporter, SLC711, and certainly there may be other transporters uh, we, we haven't just studied in this project. And also so a question from Bill Kenin, high glutamate blocks XCT, so might be uh, useful for ex vivo proof of concept. So that's a great question. So I forgot to mention that this, um, you know, 
SR system 11 also called XCT. So it's an endpoint protein, which import the system but export the glutamate. So that, that is a great suggestion, yes. So yeah, would be very interesting to look at the glutamate blocks, yes. Thank you. Should we move on to the panel discussion? Let's do it. Great. Um, do we is Dr. Uh, Kalen also uh, included in uh, the in the panel? I think I am. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, let's start off. Do you have any questions for for any of the particular um, speakers at this point in time? Do I? Uh, yeah. I have been given that privilege. Absolutely. Uh, now I think there were really interesting uh, talks. I'm just going to, as one of the oldest people participating in this meeting, I'm just going to make a, a plea. And that is, you might have noticed that, uh, maybe because I'm older, mo most of my slides were the equivalent of what used to be 135 millimeter slide with like one thing, one panel, one graph, one something or other. And I, I think uh, in the PowerPoint era, the, the temptation is to put so much information on one slide that it sometimes detracts a little bit. I don't, it's not an advantage in my mind. So I think if we're really trying to educate each other, I think we should all try to simplify the slides a teeny bit, at least for the benefit of the old timers like myself who have trouble with their glasses, so they can really see some of these wonderful pieces of data and critique, critique them uh, properly. Uh, and then secondly, I mean, Tony gave me a very nice uh, plug. And again, I, I wrote these pieces because I've made some of the very same mistakes. But I, I just think in general, if you do anything to a cancer cell and the cancer cell becomes less fit, the cancer cell becomes sick, it proliferates less well, it forms tumors less well. In any of those so-called down assays, the effect is really off target until proven otherwise. And so not to pick on any one speaker, but you know, when I see an IGFR inhibitor being used at the 10 to 20 micromolar concentration, uh, until I am shown proof to the contrary, that is an off target toxic effect. And I know it's a pain in the neck. I could use other body parts there, but we might have children on the line, so I'll say a pain in the neck. But I think you have to do the additional experiments to show you're on target because it's just too easy to poison cells. I think the second thing, and I think a number of speakers demonstrated this, obviously the other thing that helps you is if you can come to the same conclusion several different ways and you have corroborating lines of evidence. I think that's very helpful. But uh, although it is a pain in the neck, I think the tools exist to try to show that you're really uh, on target when you measure some of these loss of fitness phenotypes or what might simply be loss of fitness phenotypes. Great, thanks for that uh, very sage advice of that on, on a presentation as well as experimentation. Um, I have a, a specific question for, for uh, Jean Chen um, and I think it's also sort of perhaps broader question for, for the group anyhow, but you know, we're, we're dealing with a polygenic disease or one where there are multiple mutations. And so, for example, you know, the MTAP story, um, you know, here we have a, a gene that's found on 9P, but we know there's also CDKN2A there. And so when we then look at Kaplan-Meier curves of, of differential outcome and, for example, MTAP deficient cell, you know, we're not sure whether this is a passenger or a driver event. Um, and, and so I guess the first question is, you know, how do we you know, what's what's the approach and strategy to to make sure that this really is that that sort of independent event and and then the you know um, the, the second question is just from a, a therapeutic perspective I mean you know there are there are you know simpler ways really to 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 deal with this like for example pemetrexid if we do yep. believe MTAP is is super important um, you know we don't have to go to IGFR we could even use pemetrexid um, so just some comments uh, Jean. Is she still on? Yeah, she was having a bit of an unstable internet. <laughs> Maybe while she's trying, oh, she's on, good. Yeah, I am on. I apologize for the bad internet. So for the first question, uh, actually it's hard to, to I think for, for the outcome, 
um, in addition to MTEC, I think other type, maybe other gene may associate with the outcome. So it's very, uh, I, it's hard to say just only outcome is due to the, the loss of MTEC, but uh, that's, that could be a driver that could for a disease progression. So maybe uh, we can also look into other type of um, gene muta mutation to look at the outcome. So I hasn't, uh, I didn't have a chance to, to look at uh, 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 such as VHL, this uh, is very important in the RCC. So I, I didn't look into this, but currently we are testing um, is any multiple uh, gene mutation or deletion associated with the RCC patient's outcome. And for the, for the second question, so due to the internet is not, it's bad. So maybe I, I misunderstand the question. So for the therapeutics, uh, for MTEC, because... Oops. Uh, compared to the uh, uncle gene, the overexpression of gene, it's hard to do that. And the, my strategy for loss of function for the gene um, deletion in, in cancer, how can we target this type of cancer? Right. So I, I look at the, the, uh, the either protein or the target of MTEP, the downstream of MTEP and directory. Maybe I, in addition to IGF-1, I believe other type, maybe there's other uh, target for the MTEP deficiency in the context of MTEP deficiency. But, uh, in um, among all the uh, I drive one is done. So come and in 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 addition, the reason why I prefer uh, the use the inhibitor is because that inhibitor has been under clinical trial for uh, phase uh, clinical phase three. So that the off target issue or the toxic issue may be easier if we develop the new drug. So I was thinking to repurposing to repurpose the the, the drug. Uh, hello? Yeah. Uh oh. Any other comments from the panel on, on that? Yeah, yeah Eric, if, if I can jump in since I'm clearly in my cranky old man phase and I've already now railed the young people. You know, I, I just think. Uh, whether something is or is not associated with a good prognosis or a bad prognosis, as you know, carries almost no weight in terms of whether it's a good target. So, for example, the, one of the best validated targets in all of cancer medicine is the estrogen receptor, which is associated with a good prognosis in breast cancer. And if something happens to be associated with a bad prognosis, it doesn't necessarily tell you it's it's causative. I mean, it could be a consequence of aggressive behavior and not the cause of the aggressive behavior. And then the final thing I tell young people is by the time you validate a prognostic marker, you know, a prognostic marker is always in the context of the standard of care. And so by the time you validate your prognostic marker, it may no longer be a prognostic marker because the field has moved in terms of the standard of care therapy. So I think it's important for young people to know what prognostic markers do or don't tell you. But I can tell you when I'm thinking about cancer drug targets, I, I place no weight on whether they are or are not associated with a good prognosis or a bad prognosis. I think it's almost orthogonal to whether they actually play a causal role in those tumors. You can be both, you could be none, you could be right. one of the two. I mean, the story of HER2 and the RPR in breast. I mean, the only thing I would add, Bill, that you know, BAP1 mutated tumor, you know, patient don't do well. So it's more so of an unmet need. However, once you're metastatic, you're metastatic. So that's all. Right. No, I think BAP1 is telling you that there's a different biology there and that those are bad actors. That's for sure. But, uh, you know, what, 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 I, what I don't accept is when people look at their favorite gene, find some Kaplan-Meier curve where there's curve separation and try to make this house of cards argument that since my favorite genes associated with a bad prognosis, it must be a good target. Uh, I think BAP1 is a good target because kidney cancers go to the trouble of mutating BAP1. Uh, and as I say, it's clearly a different biology, just as ER positive breast cancer is a different biology than triple negative breast cancer. 
but just because something's overexpressed or is associated with a bad prognosis doesn't really credential it as a target. Hey, Bill, I have a quick question. I really like your concept of the targeting trunk mutation, such as VHL. If you target a VHL, also, you know, secondary mutations will not be survived. I'm wondering, I mean, very naive thinking, do you think that gene therapy AV-based VHL targeting strategy might be feasible in kidney cancer therapy, correcting, you know, VHL mutation? Yeah, well, I was asked that question the other day. I mean, in general, I think that's true for most uh, truncal mutations in cancer, unless they're truly hit and run mutations or they're simply so-called caretaker mutations. So I think I think the challenge is simply a technical one, whether you could get a high enough uh, uh, efficiency of gene transfer that you could affect all the cancer cells. Because if you don't, you can be sure you'll rapidly select for the cells that didn't take up, in this case, VHL. But you know, someday, maybe before I die, that's the kind of approach people will take. Maybe they'll do somatic gene therapy and they'll correct VHL in these tumors. On that note, uh, uh, <laughs> a, uh, an aspirational um, goal and, and question and statement from, from uh, Dr. Kalen. Uh, fantastic presentations uh, from everyone. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I think the future is bright. Um, keep working hard. And uh, I think we're ready for our next session. I'd just like to speak to one question that came from the audience that was wondering about whether these pathways were be, being looked at in rarer kidney cancers. And uh, I think that, you know, a lot of what has been talked about here um, might be applicable, um, but is also uh, linked in uh, to the VHL pathway. And so I think you'll see through other uh, uh, talks throughout the conference, uh, hopefully uh, some of this will get uh, addressed as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate everybody's pitching in there and, and creating that conversation. It was really, I, unfortunately for me, I, I'm not able to understand all of it, but I know that uh, you all are trying to bring it down to a level, um, Dr. Phelan, with your comment about making slides simpler. The patient community will really appreciate that as well. So don't worry, that comment I get all the time, including <laughs> yesterday. And I <laughs> but I appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much Naomi for moderating and thanks to all the panelists today to jo for joining in. I um, really appreciate that conversation. On that okay. note, I think it's now time to move right into session number two.